Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. My name is Jeff. I am an alcoholic. I feel so alone. Um... Um, because of the grace of God, uh, actions that are taken in AA, very good sponsorship. I'm very happy to tell you my sobriety date is March 16th, 1992. And, um, you know, applaud, uh, applaud yourselves. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here. I want to thank the committee for asking me and, uh, my wife, Heidi, uh, for making the trip. Uh, I want to thank well, apparently I've got eight hosts, but um, I want to thank Roberts, the one that's been, he contacted me, and he called me a couple of weeks ago, and he said, uh, I'm going to show you parts of Colorado that the tourists don't see. And uh, I'm like, okay, well, that's interesting. And then we took off in his truck, and we went through a stream, um, <laughs> up a mountain, and... Uh, At some points, it was not even roads. I mean, even wildlife was like, wow. Um, So I asked him about bear. That got his gun waved in my face. So um, not a lot's changed in some respects, I guess. Um, Anyway, but I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm going to get this out of the way right now because, uh, as many of you know, I'm uh, my wife and I both. Fargo is flat and like 900 elevation. Uh, our tallest building is like four stories. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm suffering from, I guess it would be called altitude sickness. And uh, it's, it's manageable, I suppose, but doesn't seem to be getting better. One of the side effects is I get out of breath a lot. So if you see me gasping, uh, relax, we'll be okay. Um, I, uh, I don't know how your brain works, but I have it. People have, I suppose, this light bulb that comes on for for great ideas. I have two light bulbs on. I have a great idea light bulb that doesn't go off very often. And then um, I have an alcoholic idea light bulb that's always going off. And so (laughs) this morning I woke up and I'm like, you know, this elevation, this altitude sickness, I can't seem to get get it, make it better. I know. Let's go higher up. And uh, (laughs) we went up the mountain. Because I have never uttered the sentence, I'm high enough, thank you. Um, I'm not going to now. So we went up, I don't know where I was, somewhere. Um, I just knew I was looking down at clouds, which is pretty magical. Um, So thank you for uh, having me. I want to uh, touch on something. I was supposed to speak here two years ago, and um, I want to talk about that. I I don't share this from the podium. Maybe I should. I don't know. But um, the memories of two years ago are intertwined with this convention for me. We were were planning on making it a family trip. We were going to bring all our kids. We were going to drive, which, God help us, that would have been a mistake. But um, And we were going to, you know, come and, and have a great time. And shortly before... We were scheduled to leave. My wife's father uh, had been sick with cancer, and she got a call and said that uh, she needed to come home. She needed to come, that things didn't look good. And so on that same morning, I got a call from my father's uh, wife saying that my dad had had a stroke and was in the hospital. So Heidi and the kids went back home to be with her father, and I stayed in Fargo to be with my father, and it was, uh, of course, stressful and tense. And then one morning, um, Heidi called me, and she let me know that uh, her dad had passed away. And a few hours later, my father passed away. Um, it's, it's an uncanny story. Uh, our fathers, ironically enough, were born on the exact same day and same year. And our wedding is on their birthday. And um, so our our kids, both of their grandfathers died on the same day. And um, 
I was I was in the hospital with my father. My sister and I were there with him. And um, my dad took his last breath, and, and my sister and I, I mean, just the weight of everything that was going on just, you know, pushed us down. And we fell into each other's arms, and we were crying, and all of a sudden I felt an arm come around me and an arm come around her. And a gentleman, um, a male nurse who I sponsor, who didn't work in that section of the hospital, but he knew what was going on, and he wasn't supposed to be in the room, but thank God he breaks those rules. Um, <laughs> but he was standing there, and uh, he literally held me up. And I'll tell you, if you hear nothing else I say tonight, that is the way Alcoholics Anonymous has been for me, is that I, I get out of it what I put into it. And I'm a big believer in trying to work with others, and I'm a big believer in the concept of sponsorship, but not, not in the way that I used to, not in the ego-gratifying way. I tell the guys, the gentlemen that I have the privilege to work with, I say, we're going to trudge this path together. And that's what we do, because life has its ups and downs, and it comes at you with things. And we're going to trudge this together. I am not some omniscient guru or anything else. I do not have magic answers. I have experience, a lot of bad. Uh, and I have the distinct advantage of sometimes having an unemotional point of view in your life. And, and if you can accept that, we'll do just fine. And so I, I get the chance, and, and, and I lean on the guys I sponsor in the situations like that. Um, and I could, I could give you a hundred others where AA has been there for me when I needed it most. Uh, so... Thank you for giving me the opportunity to come back. Um, it means a lot, and it's, it's special to me to be here. Um, on another note, I've always wanted to share this story. I've had to wait over two years to share it. Um, somebody, I don't know who, I apologize, but somebody called me to ask to, sp to speak at this convention three years ago, whenever it was. And, man, they were excited, uh, and they were excited about this conference. And so... I'm on the phone as they're just going 100 miles an hour. And my children, who at the time were 13 and 11, they're sitting at the kitchen counter eating cereal. And all they can see is me pacing around on the phone. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. At the end of this conversation, she's so excited. She says, Jeff, I love you. And um, I don't know how you react to that, but I don't want to not be loved. So I say, I love you. And... Uh, <laughs> seemed like the right thing to do. So my son, he's eating cereal and he stops and he goes, was that mom? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. Well, who was it? And this is to show you where AA is at in my home. I said, it's a woman in AA I've never met. Oh, okay, okay. Everything's fine. Very good. <laughs> um, I'm not a guy who I was succeeding at life and then I started drinking and drinking took me down a horrible road and drinking brought out all these defects of character and suddenly one day I magically walked through the doors and put the plug in the jug and resumed wonderful living um that is in no way my story. I was screwed up and goofy way before I ever drank. And I wasn't raised in a bad home, and I wasn't told these things that I believed about myself. But I just seemed to be wired different than my fellow man. And I felt different from them. And I seemed to just, my head is just feels like it's full of bad wiring. And I don't know how to explain any of this to anyone. I just know that something's off with me. I have a, a really racy mind, and it's just always going. And it's always analyzing things, and not helpful things. Not like, I wonder if I could cure cancer. Let me analyze it. Um, <laughs> but it's analyzing things like tones of voice uh, that people use when they greet me. And was that sincere, or was he really not, you know? <laughs> it's making comparisons. I'm a sensitive individual, really, really sensitive. And you may say, well, you mean when people say mean things to you, your, your feelings get hurt? No, I could survive with that. Uh, I'm talking about this ridiculous type of sensitivity. Like, for example, I am offended and hurt when I am not invited to things that I don't want to go to in the first place. 
you know? Man. Because I want to at least have the... Yes, I know you want me there. I can't be there, of course. I'm much too busy. But thank you. Um, I am... Uh, it hurts my feelings if you compliment the person next to me. And if I could step out of my skin and not have to pretend to be normal, I'd say that to people. You know, if someone comes up to me and someone's standing next to me, and you say, oh, man, that's a really nice tie. My re immediate reaction is, what's the matter with my tie? <laughs> and I'd like to say, what was wrong with you? Why would you compliment this guy in front of me? That's so rude. Uh, don't... <laughs> <laughs> What's with this guy? Get him a drink. Um, <clears throat> I'm an egomaniac with an inferiority complex. I think I have this horrible low self-esteem and self-loathing, uh, yet it can just spiral. It can spring back. I remember walking into job interviews and thinking, you know, God, oh my, I don't even belong in this building, and they're going to realize that, and they're going to throw me out. And then I start, you know, I, I ding the first question. I think, these company would be fools not to hire me. And, um, you know, just <laughs> simultaneously I can seem to feel this way. Um, and I'm always looking for my spot. I'm always looking for where I'm going to finally fit and belong and where these feelings are going to subside. And, where I, and I've found a lot of them. I have found a lot of places where I'm like, this is it. This is where I belong. This is what I was missing. This extracurricular activity, this relationship, this group of people, whatever it is. And it is it for a little while. But this is not a little while problem I'm dealing with. And eventually things start to lose their shine for me. And I think to myself, this isn't it either. And I move on. And I try the next thing. And I'm all the while trying to figure out what is the matter with me and what is wrong with me and how do I fix it. Um, did I mention a high highs and low lows? No? Let me mention that. Uh, my emotions always seem to be at peak. I am never happy. I am ecstatic. I am never sad. I am depressed. I am always, you know, and in the course of a couple of minutes, um, I walk in, I take everything around me going on, I take everything going on around me personal. I don't know if anyone else does this, but like I walk into a convenience store and the young woman smiles at me and says, well, welcome. And I take it personally. Well, this woman's into me. Oh my God, this is awesome. And, uh, <laughs> It doesn't occur to me she's doing her job. And, uh, <laughs> and then I see a wedding ring, and I pull it back down to earth. I'm never going to meet anyone, uh, you know. And um, I don't know how to, uh, I don't know what to do with all of this. I don't know how to tell people this is how I feel. Most of all, I don't know what the answer is. I know what the answer is today. I found the answer when I was 15 years old, and it was alcohol. Alcohol was not the problem. Alcohol was the answer. Alcohol comes into my life, and it starts to fill holes and gaps in me that nothing else has ever been able to do. It makes me into a whole individual. And for the first time in my life, I'm like, this is who I've wanted to be. This is how I want to feel. You know, I was another symptom of mine is I'm always so concerned with what everybody thinks of me. Everybody. And if there's a hundred people in the room and 99 of them think I'm okay, who do you think I'm fixated on? That hundredth person. And I hate that about myself. I don't want to be that kind of guy. I want to be a guy who doesn't care what anybody thinks about him. And you've met these people. And I try and emulate them, but I'm not wired to do it. You know, I don't care what anybody thinks of me. I'm just me. Well, that's good, Jeff, because Jerry doesn't like you. Why? What did I do? <laughs> you know, a macho guy. He came not, you know. Let me paint you a picture. I remember going out, and my head's racing, and I'm in high school, and I look around, and it's just my mind's going 100 miles an hour, and I'm looking and looking and looking, and I, I make these observations. I look at what people are wearing. I'm never wearing what's in fashion. I'm never wearing what's cool. I must, and I look around, and I'm like, we're in the middle of summer at a bonfire, and I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt. I'm the only guy here in a long sleeve shirt. What does it matter with me? And then this guy would come in, this guy who I was always intimidated by guys because they always seemed cool. He's got a tank top on and his hat on backwards, and he's high-fiving everybody. Everybody loves him, and uh, I don't love him. Um, I hate that guy because I want to be like him, and I can't. And then she would walk into the room, and uh, she is a girl that I'm pursuing, uh, when I say I'm pursuing, I don't mean I'm taking any action whatsoever. <laughs> but uh, I think about her a lot. And uh, um, 
And I think to myself, if I could just get her, everything would be okay. Everything would be different. But a girl like that would never go out with a guy like me. Never. So I'm not even going to put myself in the, in the spot to be rejected. And then I start drinking. And somewhere along the lines, things start changing. The party doesn't change. The people don't change. But the way I'm seeing it changes. I immediately start to look around, and I think I'm glad I came tonight because I'm making this party. It's full of a bunch of buffoons. But uh, I'm bringing it all. And uh, I go seek out Mr. Cool, and I let him know, hey, if you're looking for trouble, you found it. And, uh, man, I love being that guy. And uh, I go stake her out, and uh, I let her know tonight is her lucky night. And... I'm picking her. I could have any woman I want at this party, most of the men, and I'm picking you. And uh, she doesn't seem to see it that way, and I'm not in the least bit bothered. I lock her in the bathroom until she comes to her senses. Um, I drink a little too much. I get into a little bit of trouble. People start coming out of the woods and making suggestions to me, but it's like, you don't understand. I know, yeah, I got a little out of hand last night, and I shouldn't have done what I did. But it's not alcohol. I'm certainly not an alcoholic. No, 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 no. I have my problems when I'm sober. I think about suicide when I'm sober, not when I'm on top of the world drinking. No, 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 no. And so I'm convinced that I will find the right way to control and enjoy my drinking, the great obsession of every alcoholic. I seem to be able to do one or the other, but I cannot do both. (laughs) I, on rare occasions, can control it, I have no idea why you would want to, but uh, (laughs) under certain duress, I've been able to. And I certainly, of course, when I'm enjoying it, um, we're just going hell's bells. And uh, I can't figure it out. I continued to have these symptoms. I continued. It seemed odd. I did notice that I drank more than I anticipated or than I planned to. I got a little out of hand later on in the night, um, but not a big deal. One night in particular, um, by this time, I was becoming kind of an emotional, sloppy drunk. uh, And I was... uh, I hurt a lot on the inside. And I got drunk, and I wasn't happy-go-lucky anymore. I was, I was emotional. And if I hurt, I wanted you to hurt, too. And I started telling everybody off at this party. And, and uh, eventually, just everybody backed away from me. Just I was me on one side, kind of like tonight, me on one side of the room, <laughs> everybody else. And, uh, and this gal stepped forward, and she said, what is the matter with you? And a, and a voice deep inside of me where the truth lies is, I don't know. I don't know. This, I didn't plan on any of this. I don't want to say the things I'm saying. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to be the person I am. I don't know how to change it. I don't know how to get off this wheel. But the bottom line is, I don't know what's the matter with me. Not at all. Now, we had, I, it was hard to tell on a stand up, but um, we had some people sit down for, under a year of sobriety, and I want to welcome you. Um, one of the more baffling aspects of alcoholism is how, how persistent it will tell you that you don't have it. It's the only illness of its kind that will do that. You don't see cancer patients in denial about cancer, uh, but alcoholism will vehemently tell you that you don't have it. And it's hard to know. It's hard to figure out. And I've always found it strange. I like to, I know we love God bless AA, but I like to poke a little fun of it. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous has no official definition of alcoholism. I find that to be a little strange. Um, I can't think of another organization that would do this. I can't imagine the Di- National Diabetes Association. You know, what is diabetes? Well, we don't know, but we, we don't like it. We know that. And, uh, <laughs> but God bless AA. You know, you walk in the doors and you're new, and you ask someone, well, what, what is alcoholism? Yeah, we don't know. We're not sure. Um, <laughs> Well, do I have it? We can't tell you that. No, no, no. We don't do that. All right, well, what, what should I do? You just do what we do. That's what you do. And what will I get? You'll get what we have. Welcome to a new freedom. Um, and... Uh, Now, I say that a tissue jest. Um, you will find underneath the laughter and some of the 
brevity that goes on around here, there's a very deadly earnestness about what we're dealing with. And we may not have an official definition of alcoholism, but we all have our own experience, and we know that. And when that girl asked me what was the matter with me, I didn't know then. I know now. I know today. And if I could somehow go back in time and answer that question, I would, I would give a much different answer. I would explain to her that what's wrong with me is that I have alcoholism. It's an illness, and it affects me in three facets. It affects me physically, mentally, and spiritually. Physically, let's talk about that. Uh, I have an allergy to alcohol. My body doesn't break it down like other people. Now, I don't know or understand any of that. I do understand the concept, though, of the drink taking a drink. I understand the concept of going out thinking, I'm just going to have four, and suddenly I'm on eight, wondering how I got there. I do fully understand what it's like to drink way more than I plan to because my body will not regulate nor stop. I have no off switch when it's, once I start. Now, if you are like that with something, how long, how, eventually you're going to quit. If you have some type of an allergic reaction to something, you will just eventually stop doing it rather quickly, I would, might add. Imagine, give it another example. Imagine if you were allergic to bananas. And every time you ate a banana, you broke out in red hives. How far down the rabbit hole would you go with that? <laughs> you know, well, I know Chiquita bananas, but I'm sure Dole bananas will be fine. I mean, <laughs> that will be okay. No, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't have bananas in your house in case company showed up. <laughs> you wouldn't have some old hideous banana hidden in your glove box for emergencies. <laughs> you wouldn't do any of that. And you wouldn't be at a Bananas Anonymous meeting trying to <laughs> get through the shakes. Um, but far worse things happen to me than hives when I drink. And yet I always go back to it. Why? Because I have a mental obsession of the mind. A mind that tells me eventually it's okay to drink. It blocks out all of these great reasons. And I have tons of great reasons why I shouldn't drink for the insane idea that it will be different this time. And this doesn't have to make sense for very long. This isn't going under heavy cross-examination or anything. It just has to make sense enough to get that drink past my lips. I've gone out with some of the most absurd ideas. Uh, um, I was a guy, I used to think that the more people I told, I always told everybody I was quitting drinking. I was that guy, and uh, always going on the wagon. And... Um, I would tell everybody, and, and don't you, you know, and I had these type of friends, if I see you with a beer, I'm going to kick your butt and stuff. That's helpful. Um, and, um, but I remember going out of town, and, and I was in the back, and I'm sitting by the cooler, and we get out of town, and I grab a beer, and I crack it, and I start drinking it. And uh, my friends, they're like, well, I thought you quit drinking. Like, yeah, I did, uh, when I'm in town, not on road trips, you know. <laughs> and... Uh, made perfect sense to me, made perfect sense to the people I drank with. Oh, yeah, of course. And uh, <laughs> off we go. I have a mind that will always bring me back to drinking. This is deadly. I have a mind that's going to tell me eventually that I can drink and a body that clearly is telling me that I cannot. Deadly. And I haven't gotten to the third. The third, this spiritual deficiency this void inside of me. There's something missing in me. That I am not connected to a power that I desperately need to be connected to. I am like a lamp sitting in the corner. No matter what you do, no matter how much you tinker with it, if it is not plugged into the wall, it's not going to work. And I do not have this needed power in my life. And so as a result of that, as a result of having no type of real solution in my life, I will always eventually sober come to the three characteristics we all end up at, restless, irritable, and discontented. And everything that goes on in my life can ultimately be traced back to one of those three things. And uh, I'm always restless. I don't know what I want. I don't know what I need, but this isn't it. I need to make some kind of a change. I need to go to school, get out of school, in a relationship out. I should move. That's a great idea. And just, you know, uh, 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 uh. I'm irritable. I am tired of other people having life so much easier than me. It's not fair, and I'm sick of it, and I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> and I'm discontent. Uh, nothing keeps its shine long for me. Nothing. And eventually, when it loses its shine, I move on. And so I like things when they're new. I like things when they're shiny. But I don't stay very long. And this will be proved to be very problematic in my life. 
I can't seem to hang with jobs. I have a series of relationship problems because of this belief. Uh, and so eventually when the pain of sobriety and reality becomes so great that I will again long for a sense of ease and comfort. Ease and comfort. Is there any better way to describe drinking? That's what I've always been looking for is ease and comfort because my life is the exact opposite. It's hard and uncomfortable. And I just want that moment of ease and comfort. And unless I find a way to have some type of spiritual experience, personality change sufficient enough to bring about recovery from alcoholism, casting aside old ideas, attitudes, and outlooks upon life for a completely new set, call it what you want, unless I find a way to make it happen, I'm in a lot of trouble. And that is what I have. That is what is wrong with me. I've always thought, by the way, if I really did go back in time, to that moment when I told everyone off and then that girl asked me, what's the matter with you? And I, uh, I just rattled off everything I just rattled off drunk. How impressed with me would they have been, right? You know, <laughs> that's what's the matter with me, you SOBs. And uh, by the way, I had this goofy, sick thought before the meeting. Uh, I was chuckling on the Dr. Bob fishing tournament. I'm like, if I had a time machine and I went back, I wonder what Dr. Bob would say to me if I told him, hey, by the way, someday... There's going to be a fishing tournament named after you in Crested Butte, Colorado. Um, I bet he would not believe me. Uh, go away, weird future man. Um, no idea what that means. Um, anyway, um, ooh, i gotta, I got to sober up. Um, I went down to... Uh, you know what, I'm going to, if you share a lot at AA meetings, you just you can't help it. I don't have a can to talk, but it's my story, and I tell it a lot. And so I get kind of used to, then you go here, then you go here, then you go here. I'm, quite frankly, I've been talking a lot lately, and I'm bored with my own story. So I'm veering off the tracks, and I'm going somewhere else. Um, <laughs> let's just go. Uh, take the wheel, God. Um, I couldn't find a way out of this mess that I was calling my life, and uh, nothing seemed to work. I botched two suicide attempts. I talk about one a lot. I don't actually talk about the other. Um, my first one, they were meant, I mean, they were sincere, but uh, high, being highly intoxicated and trying to commit suicide can some, sometimes be problematic. Um, <laughs> so I took a handful of, I OD'd one time on pills. And uh, I, I meant to take sleeping pills, but drunkenly I grabbed the wrong bottle and took vitamin C. Um, <laughs> so and that got me to the psych ward. And, uh, and then one time, uh, I, spent, I don't know if anyone else did this, but I spent a lot of time researching suicide. I just, I don't know, I was kind of a borderline expert on it once upon a time, and uh, I had all these, all these different ways. I, I'm not a gun guy. I, I don't own guns. I don't know. I didn't want to do that. And, uh, I didn't want to hang myself because I had heard that you, you know, lose control of all your stuff, and I'm like, well, I'm still concerned with the people that would find me liking me and being impressed with me, and uh, <laughs> so... Uh, I would read that freezing to death is like one of the best ways in the world to, to die because um, you just you fall asleep and uh, somewhat painless, they told me, and then just angels come along, and it's beautiful. And, uh, you know, I live in North Dakota. It's a perfect spot. Beautiful. This is, I got this. So one night in a big morbid depression, I was in college, and... Uh, <laughs> It didn't, it didn't occur to me maybe just go sit in a snowbank. Uh, so I went to my dorm room, but I turned the heat off, and I opened the window. And then I, I sat, I sat down in the chair, bottle of schnapps or something, and uh, some horrible cigar, and uh, ready to die. Um, and then I remember like 15 minutes later thinking, Jesus, it's cold. And uh, whew, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get my banky and uh, <laughs> eventually passed out in bed. But uh, <laughs> I hurt. 
and I was desperate. I loved what Father Tom said about the gift of desperation and the G.O.D. Um, God, somebody told me one time that after you've been sober for 10 years, you've heard everything you'll ever hear in an A meeting. I am thankful to report that is wrong. Uh, I'd never heard that, and it put some things in my story into place. I, I drove around. Shortly before I would sober up, I drove around, and I did the most sincere, heartfelt prayer that I could to the God of my understanding at that point in time, and it was cursing him out and yelling and punching the window, and just screaming at him. But I've come to believe that the God of my understanding isn't really that concerned with my tones of voice. He may not even be concerned with the words. There was a genuine sentiment there of, I want a way out. And I wasn't given what I wanted, but I was given what I needed. What I wanted was someone to come along with a magic wand. and Shoo, there's a magic Bill Wilson spiritual experience. Boom. Hopefully Time Magazine will make you one of the hundredth most influential people in the world, too. And, uh, okay, um... But I didn't get that. I got the gift of desperation. And uh, for me, that meant coming back. I'd been to AA before, and, and uh, it meant coming back to Alcoholics Anonymous. I was 21, and I was, uh, I was afraid, and I was hopeless, and I was convinced secretly that I was crazy. But most of all is I just had given up. I didn't know what to do. And uh, I started going to meetings of AA, and I slowly but surely there were two things that took place for me. And I think, I can't prove this and I don't want to argue with you if you have different experience, but I think two things need to happen for AA to work. The first has to be identification. Because I've spent my whole life being so unique, so different from you. I'm a guy who compares my insides to your outsides and you always look better than I'm feeling. You always... All right. Uh... <laughs> Is that thunder? <laughs> yeah, God's here. And uh, get him, Jeff. <laughs> um, <laughs> you always look better than I feel. And uh, I am completely screwed up. I completely lost. Where was I? Thank you. These guys aren't listening. They're thinking about the golf tournament. I don't know. In my backswing, I got to get it up. Um <laughs> Oh, identification. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I started to identify. I started to think, oh, my God, I drank like that. I think like that. I feel like that. And I started to, the, the, the light bulb, the good one, started to come on and say, maybe I have alcoholism. Maybe that's what my problem is. I used to keep a journal. When I would come home, I was drunk. I was always writing in it, rambling. And it's just diary of a madman. But uh, the last entry... <laughs> it's just got, I could have almost just entitled it Four Step and given it to my sponsor, just full of <laughs> fear and resentment and sex arms. But um, my last entry is, uh, I now know what's wrong with me. My name is Jeff, and I'm an alcoholic. Case closed. And that's what's been wrong with me since March 16th of 1992. And I found that out here. I found that out by listening to you. And then you really started to give me the gift. Because the gift in and of itself of identification is wonderful. It's a wonderful feeling to realize I don't have to be alone anymore. I am not so unique. There are people out there like me. But then to go to the next step and the next level, and they found a way out, hope. They found a way to seemingly live sober and be happy with it and be okay with it. And maybe, just maybe, if I do what they do, I'll get what they have. That's exactly what AA offered me, and it's exactly what I signed up for, and it's exactly what I've gotten. So the people that I heard that, sorry, I'm having a moment of breathlessness. Um, is that a word? Um, it is? Breathlessness is a word? Sweet. You could have, a breathtaking. Well, my talk is breathtaking. Um, <laughs> for me. Um, <laughs> so the people that... Um, seemed to have what I wanted. Where there was common denominators amongst them. And I started to put these things in place. They were very active. And I noticed that most of the people who seemed to enjoy being at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and were of some form or another of service to it had sponsors. And this is where my recovery would begin, uh, is that I got a sponsor. And I believe very, very strongly in sponsorship. I, I say both sides of it, meaning being a sponsor and having one. But I've since kind of changed that viewpoint because I don't think you have to be a sponsor because that's not what the chapter is entitled. It's just working with others. 
Give of your time. Listen. You want to carry the message sometime? Listen. Just let someone talk. It doesn't always have to be me blabbing. And uh, so, but I do believe in some form or another, Peg Martin, or Peggy, I'm sorry, talks about, you know, a, a sea and you have to have water coming in and water going out or it dies. And the same is true for me. So I got a sponsor. And uh, this is where things would start to change for me. And sponsorship, I've come to realize this is the, my new way of describing it, if you will. But here's why sponsorship works so well for me. If, if any one of us, any one of you and I, were to sit down with the task of we are each going to draw a picture of me. You're going to draw a picture of me, and I'm going to draw a picture of me based on my recollection. I am clearly in the advantage here. Obviously, I know myself way better than you. Obviously, I've spent years looking at myself in the mirror, and um, I have the advantage. But do I? My drawing is going to be based on memory, on recollection, on mood. And trust me, if my self-esteem is a little low that day, I'm going to draw myself a little wider. And um, (laughs) you, on the other hand, even though you've never met me, have the distinct advantage of doing nothing but just looking and drawing with what you see. And that is what my sponsor can do. He does not have this maze of justifications and rationalizations and, yeah, but people don't treat me special and all this stuff that I bring to the table. He can just look at me and what's going on and identify my selfishness and help me realize where fear has again infiltrated its way into my life. Help me find out where I owe an amend. Help me realize that I have given God a two-week vacation in my life and I need to bring him back. Uh, and so I need that. And then I have to be able to pass it on. So I got a sponsor and he got me active and he got me involved in a home group and I had to have a job in my home group. And we had to meet weekly and we had to go through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which I found out they hid the instructions on how to work the steps in there. And... Um, <laughs> We're doing all of this stuff, and uh, he was, I don't know, I found out later he was new back to town, and uh, he'd been instructed by his sponsor to start working with sick, desperate alcoholics, (laughs) and uh, there was an abundance of us running around. So there was this whole gaggle of us running around, and and, uh, they would literally trick me into doing things. Um, They'd say things like, we're going to speak at the hospital on Saturday night. Are you in? And before I could think of anything, they're, yeah, you're in. Um, so we're all meeting at so-and-so's house at 5. Jesus, that seemed early. You know, the meeting doesn't start till 8. But by this time, I knew he had me greeting at every meeting I was at like an idiot for three hours. So I just assumed I was going to stand outside the door. And uh, we get in the car, and we take off, and we start going out of town. I'm like, well, I thought we were speaking at the hospital. He's like, well, we are, the state hospital in Bismarck, 100 miles away. <laughs> and off we go. And um, I'm sitting in the back, middle, hump, and uh, <laughs> I'm not happy about any of this. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, well, this couldn't get any worse. <laughs> yeah, wrong. Um, the guy in front, The sponsor, and I don't know if you guys have it in Texas or Colorado, but if you find someone who starts really working with alcoholics, inevitably at number three, one of them becomes what I like to call the good one. And these are the people that are fired up on AA. They love it. They're praying. They've been promoted at work. Uh, (laughs) Just, you know, it's like you're a week sober, really. And uh, I've done a 180. And it's like, all right. Um. Well, Chris was the good one, right? And Chris was in the front because Chris was early. And uh, he wasn't late and had to get the, hey, when you're five minutes late, for four of us, that's 20 minutes of people's time you've wasted. Um, I'm getting that lecture from my sponsor. And Chris pulls out as Bill sees it. And he says, I've made up a game we can play on the road. So Chris's game uh, was he was going to read from As Bill Sees It, and then we would guess what the writing was from. Was it from the big book, a 12 and 12, a grapevine, a letter Bill wrote? Um, <laughs> and I am in the back, and I am thinking to myself, absolutely not. You pull this car over and let me out in the ditch, because whatever dignity I have left, I am not wasting it on the what the hell did Bill write this in game. Absolutely not. I refuse. (sighs) It's what I thought. It's not what I said. Uh, Because I have come to believe and I have come to learn that Alcoholics Anonymous 
is a program that cares more about what I do than how I feel, and it cares more about the actions I take than the thoughts that I harbor. And I can get into trouble sometimes with my thoughts, but not a lot. And so I am literally a guy who, you know, they talk about faking it till you make it. And uh, that's exactly what I did. I took actions that my head told me would not work. And so I sat in that car thinking the things I just shared with you, but this is what I was saying. I just played along, and I guessed grapevine every time. <laughs> took second place. And... Uh, <laughs> big phony. Oh, wow. That, could that be the grapevine? And uh, wow, Jeff really knows his stuff. Um, I kept taking the right actions. And uh, this is the part. I kind of, I don't know about you, but I always kind of had it mapped out on how my recovery should go. And this, of course, would be the part now where I drank the Kool-Aid of AA. And I did. And I got in, and this is the part where I just tell you, now my life has gotten gooder and gooder and gooder. And um, let me tell you what's really happened for me. I got involved in AA. I threw myself into the center of the bed, and I started sponsoring people. I started sponsoring a lot of people. And I started meetings. We started a meeting that became the largest uh, meeting in North Dakota. I started speaking. If you want to be a big deal in AA, because that was by now my goal. I wanted to be a big deal in an anonymous organization. And, uh, <laughs> but you got to speak. You got to do that. And uh, I'm doing all of this stuff. I'm doing all of the stuff you're supposed to do as an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. All of them, except one. And that one thing that I was not doing almost killed me. The one thing that I was not doing was the one thing we're supposed to be doing here. Finding a relationship with a God of our understanding through work and self-sacrifice of others and, of course, working our 12 steps. And I was missing that. I was doing everything but. And I was handing out great advice. I had sponsees that were having all these wonderful things. But I was dying on the inside, right in the middle of A. And I, uh, what do I mean by that? I mean, things like I was always having career problems. I was always seemingly, I'm the type of guy I'm wired to resent anyone who has the authority to tell me what to do, and I make it very known at some point that I resent it or that I'm smarter than them, and then ultimately they fire me. And uh, so I keep losing jobs. Um, I'm married, and uh, I, uh, let me back, let me talk about my wife for a minute. Um, by the time I was two years sober, uh, I met a girl, as I like to say, she had what I'd been looking for all my life. Uh, which was an interest in me. <laughs> and uh, that's a very attractive quality. Um, and we started, we started dating, and, and uh, we were working together. We met. We were both hotel front desk clerks. And, and uh, we, we got hired on the same day. And I went to my sponsor, and I said, I think I've met her. And uh, he said, well, you, you shouldn't date a girl that you work with. And I, I'm active. I'm like, of course, you're right. I went down and quit my job. And, uh, <laughs> well, no, that's not what he meant. Um, we started dating, and it was a big mess. Just, a, I mean, here's how we were fighting all the time and yelling and throwing things. By the time we were dating for three months, we were seeing a marriage counselor. And uh, we weren't even engaged. And um, part of the problem is... I have this deep-seated fear that no one would ever really want to be with me. And what I require you to do to, over, to compensate for that fear is treat me special today and better tomorrow. And that is a recipe for about three good days of a relationship. <laughs> and Heidi tried. Man, she tried, but just no one was going to. The hoop got so high and so small that no one could jump through it. And so we had this dance, as we call it, in... Heidi would come in, and I would always make it very known that something was wrong. You know, I'm always sulking in the corner, all pouty pants. And uh, <laughs> Heidi would always take the bait. And so she'd be like, you know, what's the matter? Well, when you came in the room, you didn't tell me you loved me. And, uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I love you. <laughs> you know, well, <laughs> what, what's wrong now? That didn't sound sincere. Um, <laughs> and she'd say, she'd say Oh, well, I love you. You know, well, now what? Well, it's, I had to tell you to sound sincere. Now it's disingenuous. And I uh, just on and on and on. And uh, by the way, years later, my wife 
would, uh, she would join Alan on. And I know we have Alan on people here. You people screwed up my wife big time. Um, <laughs> let me tell you how bad you screwed up my wife. I would try this game on her. She'd walk into the room. I'd, and this is what I'd get. You know what? When you're done, God and I will be over here waiting for you. And, uh, <laughs> whoa, that's harsh. Um, it's, uh, you know, I used to naively think that I could just be involved and do AA and that would be enough for our family. And I don't know if it is or isn't, but I, I know I, I think I could, uh, the efforts that I do in Alcoholics Anonymous can keep me sober. But we have recovery in our home coming in both sides because of Alcoholics Anonymous and now Al-Anon. And I am uh, forever grateful. I'm especially grateful. My wife, when she talks, I always tear up. And I'm not a tear up guy, but I always tear up when she talks. I'm especially gratified when I see what Al-Anon has done for our children and the lessons that you have taught her. And, the, and in turn, she's been able to pass on to our kids. It's just beautiful. So thank you for that. Um, but I am not doing well in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I am not a good husband to her. And we're having trouble now, Mr. Active AA. And uh, I'm not saying she doesn't deserve to be treated nor spoken to the way I'm doing. And it's all behind closed doors. I've got the mask that I present to Alcoholics Anonymous and then the underside of what's really going on. And uh, I'm violating trust that people are placing in me in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I do not like myself at all. And I reached a point that they call a second surrender, and it's not in any way, shape, or form aided or abetted by alcohol. It's just a pure, here I am with all of my defects of character. And a gentleman showed up in town, and when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And um, a gentleman showed up. We started talking, and, and we had lunch, and, and uh, I just spilled it all on the table. And he said, you know, Jeff, uh, there's nothing wrong with you that the steps can't fix. And it's like, God, come on. Look, I know that's what we, that's what we say, but there must be some other <laughs> answer with some meat on the bone. I mean, some kind of, you know, lost chapter of the big book that we don't share. <laughs> He goes, well, you, you need to turn your will and your life over to the care of God. Yeah, 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 I get it. I get it. I do the third step prayer every morning. Thanks. And he said, uh, he said something that changed my life. He said, I'm not talking about the third step. I'm talking about the 11th step. Third step is a decision. He said, but you will implement that decision in step 11. You will find and improve your conscious, aware, present in the now, conscious contact with God as you understand him if you follow the instructions that are outlined in the book. And so I went back and I looked at what the book says, and it's mind-blowing how complicated this is. But this is what they say. Get up in the morning and initiate contact with God in some fashion. Maybe read this, do some prayers, read some readings. Woo, okay. Think about God all throughout the day. Check in, pause when agitated. Ask for direction and inspiration. Oh, so I'm going to spend all day thinking of God. And then at night, check in with him on your 11th step. How did you do? And if you do those three things, imagine that. If you get up and invite God into your life, think about him all day, and then check in and see how you did, you will improve your conscious contact with God. Why did nobody ever tell me that? Um, <laughs> and so he got me going back. I, I eventually got that gentleman to be my sponsor. He got me going through the steps. And uh, I did a new fourth step. And I had all these egregious harms that had been committed to me and all the people that I resented. And at the top of it was my wife, Heidi. And uh, Heidi, had uh, we'd gotten into debt bad, and I didn't know anything about it. She came to me when she finally had to, and she explained to me that we were in debt, and it was bad, and, and I was mad. Oh, there's nothing worse than an alcoholic who's genuinely been harmed. You know, I spent so much time imagining that it's happened <laughs> that when it, when it finally has happened, oh, God. Ugh. And um, they say nothing, nothing worse than a woman scorned, but I'm going to tell you, an alcoholic harmed can be one of the most self-righteous jerks in the world. And uh, I, uh, I took the finances over, not lovingly, not kind, not supportively. I took them over. Whether you've screwed this all up, you're out, and I will get us out of debt. And I put my alcoholic determination to get us out of debt. I researched it, and I studied it, and just we can do great things when we can focus our willpower. We just can't focus it usually on anything helpful. Um, but by God, we were going to get out of debt. And she was locked out. She did not have the password. She did not have anything. If she needed money, she had to come to me. That is your punishment for what we have done. 
And I am doing my fourth step, reading this to my sponsor, reading this resentment, and reading these harms that she had done. And my sponsor stopped me, and he goes, just out of curiosity, who spent the money? I don't know what that has to do with anything. And... Uh, <laughs> He goes, so you were off spending the money, and it was her job to reel you back in. Is that fair? No. And then he pointed out a bunch of other wrongs that I had been committing. And so I got on a plane. I, I flew down to my sponsor's hometown to do my fifth step, and I got on a plane, and I flew back home. And my first amend, because that was the other thing, marching orders, we're going to get rolling on amends. Uh, this is not a holiday where you do a couple of them once a year. We're going to live this thing. Your theme of the spiritual life not being a theory, we have to live it. we got to get going. Life is in session, and I have committed harms towards people, and I need to make things right. And the first one I got a chance to make right was my wife. And I immediately told her how wrong I had been for handling the situation the way I did. I gave her every passcode, every card, everything, and said, we are now a team. And you can do with it what you want. You don't have to get my permission. Nothing. Uh, but we are a team. And we didn't have a bad marriage, but I'm telling you, I felt something change that night in the kitchen when we had that talk. There was some kind of a cement that started to form there, and it strengthened. And all because uh, I was willing, and someone showed me uh, how to work our 12 steps. As I said, I committed myself to really doing what we're supposed to do here. And I committed myself to uh, to finding a way to get better rather than just look better. Finding a way to, to find a God that really works. Because having a God that works from a podium at 8, 8 p.m., if it's not there with you at 2 a.m. when the demons come out, it's not working for you. And I needed a God who could be there with me, and I have one today. And it's not a strong relationship, and it's not better than yours, and it's not anything. It's just real. It's just real, and it works for me, and I'm always improving it. This is a relationship, and like any relationship, it changes. The parties involved change. Your dynamic to them changes, and that's okay. My spiritual awakening is a work in progress. It hasn't happened. I haven't arrived. I'm learning, and I'm striving for progress, and I make a lot of mistakes, and, I, uh, and that's okay. I have tools at my disposal that allow me to, uh, to make things right. And I really believe today that I'm, I'm doing the best I can. You know, I, want, I wanted to tell you at the outset of this talk that, um, that Alcoholics Anonymous is the most important thing in my life, and it really is. It is more important to me than anything, including my family. Anything. And that may sound like heresy to some, but i got to promise you that for me, I have to have it. I have to have my recovery. Otherwise, I'm not a good husband. I'm not a good father. I'm not a good employee. I'm not a good friend. I'm not a good family member. I'm not good at anything. So Alcoholics Anonymous is the most important thing. But rather than me telling you that, I hope if you could ever spend a day secretly following me around. Sounds kind of weird, but I kind of like it too. Um, <laughs> I hope that my actions would show you that. And I hope that you would see that because I'm really trying to do this thing. And I've learned from some of the best examples, people near and far. And I'm so grateful and I'm so blessed to, uh, to have that uh, and to have that in my life. Um, I want to, uh, just a couple of things and then I'll uh, close. Lee, how am I doing on time? Does that mean wrap it up or start over? Um, <laughs> gotcha. Um, I have a, I don't know why this popped into my head, but we have a lot of fun. And you guys have fun, and it's easy to pick up on that you have a lot of fun, and we're supposed to. Uh, if newcomers could see, you know, join our existence, they, you know, we don't look attractive to them. And uh, the guy, the gentleman I told you about that, I don't know why this popped into my head, but I've, I've always wanted to share this with somebody, the one who put his arms around me. Uh, he's Italian, and sometimes he and I will do 12-step calls together. And I don't know why, but this is kind of our shtick when we do it. We're like, look, we're not the answer. We're not the solution. But we know a guy. And uh, <laughs> we can show you how to meet him. And uh, <laughs> I don't know why that popped into my head, but um, it was fun. Um, so we have a family. And we're sober. That's cool. My, uh, I always wondered... Took me a while to figure this out, but I always we're, we were happy, joyous, and free. They say. And one day I was sitting in a meeting, spending too much time thinking, and I thought, I don't really know what those things mean. I understand freedom. I get that. I'm free from a mental obsession of the mind. I'm free from the bondage of self. I understand that. But I don't know about you, but happiness and joy sound an awful 
They sound very similar to me. And uh, I don't want two words describing one emotion for my gift of recovery. So <laughs> what is the difference? And I set out on a quest to figure out what the difference was. Uh, and it took me a while. And uh, But I discovered it at Christmas this last year. We have a son who's he's now 14. Middle name, by the way, is uh, Wilson, after Bill Wilson. And uh, he had to write a, an essay one time on his how he be, how he got his name, and he wrote that he was named after he was named after Bill Wilson, the man who saved his daddy's life. And uh, he's a he's awesome. I mean, I know I used to hate it when people got to talk about the kid. Talk about you! I've been all young and arrogant, but um, I see now why they do. I see now because this is where I really start to see recovery. I see the dad I could have been. Short-tempered, uh, non-communicative, uh, and absent. And I'm th- so grateful. Sometimes it's the, the gratitude is about what I haven't gotten rather than what I did. And so it's such a privilege to be part of his life. And so we got him a, a, a laptop computer, I don't know. And um, he wasn't expecting it. And when he opened the present on Christmas Eve, the look on his face was pure happiness. But the look on Heidi in my face was pure joy. And I finally saw what the difference was. And we get to have both here. We get to be happy. We get to have things go our way sometimes. Sometimes every light is green. Sometimes the girl says yes. Sometimes the boss calls you in to tell you what a good job you're doing. Sometimes it just happens that things go the way you think they should. And that's okay. And it's okay to be happy. But we also get the gift of joy. And I would have never asked for it because I didn't know it existed. This genuine feeling of happiness for someone else's success or well-being. I get joy when I start to look for it and see it. It's all around me. I get all these opportunities. I've been watching for it here this weekend with people. And you see it if you know where to look. This, I, the people I work with, to watch them turn around. Last week, by the way, your Alan on speaker is just a firecracker. I'm going to warn you tomorrow night, Corey. And uh, I love her. And Corey and I were, were speaking together last week at uh, uh, the Florida State Convention. And she's Alan on, and she came, I should have known better, she came up to me and she said, you and I are speaking next week in Crested Butte. And I said, no, that's two weeks from now. And, uh, <laughs> and she's like, no, it's, it's a week. And you'd think by now I would know, you don't argue with an Alan on about details. <laughs> anyway, she was right. And uh, <laughs> we get the gift of joy. And uh, I was watching a guy that, that came with me uh, last week that, that I sponsor, and he spent half the time on the phone with people he sponsors now. This guy was homeless when I met him, and now he's a useful and productive member of society, and it's just amazing to watch the real power that we have here that changes lives. I'm going to close with this story. Um, I started this talk off sharing with you um, about the loss of fathers and and what's transpired in my wife and my life. But now I want to talk to you about finding a father and gaining one. For the longest time, I didn't have any idea who to pray to when people talked about God. I didn't even know what to think of. I just, I didn't know. And uh, I found something that helped me, and I'm going to share it with you if you might be having that difficulty. When I, we have three children. We have uh, two teenagers, and then we had an oops baby. And... um, (laughs) Yeah, and she was a newborn, and one night she was, I was with her, and she was crying, and I walked into her room, and I picked her up, and I was kind of patting her, and I found myself thinking, she was kind of squirming for some reason, and I found myself thinking, you don't need to squirm at all. You, you, everything that you need, everything that you need, I'm going to provide. I'm going to make sure that you're clean and fed and warm, and most of all, I'm going to make sure that you're loved, and there's absolutely nothing that that little girl could ever, ever do to change the way I look at her or to change the way that I feel about her. And the reason that I do that is I'm her father. And that's what a father does. In a minute, we'll close this meeting with a prayer that starts off with our father. Does not stand to reason that each of us has some power in our life, some God in our life, looking at us in much the same way, thinking you don't have to struggle, you don't have to squirm. I'm going to give you everything that you need because I'm your father, 
and I love you, and there's nothing you've done nor could do that will ever change that. May God bless you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.